Hearthstone Global Games is an epic country versus country tournament where teams of four card slingers each clash for national pride. But in the end, the UK always wins. Wait, everybody knows it's Germany always wins. Um, aren't you Polish? Is winning or that matters? It's all about fun and getting along with your teammates. That's easy when their skills are legendary. Or in this case, you have an ace player who will never let you down. So we're gonna see the same old archetypes then? No. Every team needs to bring all nine classes. So we're gonna see Hunter? <sighs> I wonder. So let's recap. It's four regions, 48 countries. But, but, only one winner. Get ready for the Hearthstone Global Games. Hello, good afternoon, and welcome back to the Hearthstone Global Games Week 7, Day Number 2. I'm Falcone, joined once again by Mr. Neil Lorinda Bond. How you doing, Neil? Doing good, man. Looking forward to the action today. We've got loads of stuff coming up. Yeah, loads of stuff coming up um, as we jump to the format and I'm quickly going to explain to you how what the how the Hearthstone Global Games is going to work. There it is. All right, so stage one is going to be a 10-week round robin. As I just said, we're already in week seven, well and truly into stage one, actually coming to its conclusion soon. Yeah, loads of things today are going to actually start getting resolved and a little bit more tomorrow as well. Then going into next week, we will really have a good picture of which teams are through and which ones are not. Following stage one, it's going to be stage two of the competition where six groups of four teams are going to progress through into that round and for a three-week round robin. The top few teams are going to move forwards from that round into stage three, 16 team, single elimination. The top four teams will be joining us at a land finals. And as Sotil says, there can only be one winner. The UK always wins, right Sotil? Next, next. Maybe, maybe not. Um, still well and truly into the competition now, as we were just saying, uh, we're just about to take a look at the groups and update you if you've just been joining us as to how, how we're doing so far. And as you can see, group A, Bulgaria, still well and truly in the lead there. Yeah, that group was blown wide open yesterday by Indonesia losing to Sweden. So everything's really bunched up in the middle. And as you say, pretty much everybody apart from Switzerland still in with a chance there. You pick your own favorites out of that group. I know you've been crunching the numbers over yeah. the last couple of days, Neil, and you know exactly the situation of the groups and, and I'm who can and who can't progress. Yeah, so in this group, it's basically anybody's, obviously. You can see that just by glancing at it. The, the times it gets complicated where some teams can actually go through because of other teams have to knock right. each other out and the fixtures still remaining. Well, let's jump to Group B. United States seem pretty guaranteed to get They through. are guaranteed in anybody's mouth. Yeah, they're definitely through and they're just destroying everyone in this tournament so far. Today, though, it's going to be Romania versus Peru, the bottom two teams in this group. Uh, do these guys both have a chance? Yeah, Romania nowhere near as out as, it, as they look because they've got to play Thailand. So if they win today against Peru and then they beat Thailand, um, they will put Thailand to a negative game record. If Romania can do some big wins, they're still with a chance for sure. All right, and Group C. Argentina on top, Spain on the bottom. Is Argentina guaranteed yet? Uh, I haven't done Group C because ah. I'm playing from it today, but um, I would imagine I'll they're in off. a very good spot. Looking at that as an eyeball without knowing the fixtures remaining, I would imagine that they, they're they not guaranteed that game record and that match record obviously putting them in a good, good position. Yeah, not a bad game record there at all. Russia, maybe people would have expected that to be the top team of the group. I know Sotter would have. Uh, but, you know, still very, very strong chance of getting through, though it doesn't look like there's any certainties either way here. Yeah, this is just obviously another close group. Spain look like they're in a world of trouble. I don't think they can qualify just looking at that. All right, Group D. South Korea on top, Portugal on the bottom. Uh, do we have any of these games coming up today? Uh, we do not. So another another group that we don't need to do too much about, but I think all these teams in with a chance. Greece started 0-2, found their way up to 2-2. Two and two. Uh, their last match will be absolutely critical, as you can see. We could we could definitely see some comebacks in the Hearthstone Global, Global Games. The uh, the mm -hmm. players that are zero and three, we've seen some of them just take their first win yesterday. I think Croatia yep. uh, was one of those. Yeah, they were so happy about it as well. Yeah, they were very pleased with that win. Understandably so. Group E. Group E. There we go. Uh, Italy, my team on top. Finland. One of the more interesting teams in the competition, I think, bringing up the rear there. 
Uh, they're a team that's all about community. I'm sure that this means a lot to them. Yes, you think it's that second win. It might give them a small chance. But today is Chile and Norway going through to play each other. Winner of that one will put themselves into a very strong position indeed. They really do have everything to play for here. Uh, as it looks like Italy pretty certain to take one they're of the top good, spots. Obviously, from just, just from looking at that, you can see they're looking pretty good, yeah. Israel looking OK, but the other four teams could really go anywhere, right? Yeah, Israel, a big surprise in this tournament as well. I don't think anybody rated them at all coming in, but, you know, getting through two matches already, uh, going to put themselves in a great chance to get to the second stage. All right, and Group F. Canada and Malaysia, some dominating forces in this group. Yeah, and they can both go through today if Kazakhstan beat Belgium. Ah. Um, that will mean that all the remaining matches, uh, because France still have to play Denmark, if Canada and Malaysia will go through if Kazakhstan win the first match of the day. So they'll be watching this with interest, and they play each other tomorrow night. Uh, which would be right. from our American colleagues. So so our first game today is Kaz Kazakhstan versus Belgium. And if Kazakhstan win, Canada and Malaysia are both through? Yep. Okay, I know, all right. Like, Canada and Malaysia are sitting there. They could go through even though they're not playing. So, yeah. The stakes for this first match just got a little bit higher. Yeah, it's kind of weird how it all works out. It's just the way that the matches are going to pan out. Group G. Yeah, I mean, you can see they're just looking at that. The group is slightly less advanced than some of the other groups. Just anything can happen there. I believe it's Vietnam and Singapore tomorrow night as well. And our final game of today is Turkey versus Mexico. Uh, two of the top performers of this group, actually. Yeah, Turkey, one of the teams that have really surprised in this tournament. When you go through, actually, it shouldn't have been a surprise. Players like Raul have played plenty of HCT qualifiers and playoffs. And yeah, we should have seen this one coming. And they're just showing us, you know, don't overlook us. Don't overlook us indeed. Vietnam, Poland, our hosts, our gracious, lovely <laughs> hosts, our kind, very, very great, great hosts, Poland. Is that enough? Keep going, keep going, keep going. They're, they're, the best, think, yeah. they're actually the best Hearthstone team. There's, okay. no, there's no gun to my head right now. I'm You're... saying that from my own free will. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, so Dan there just, you know, making sure he gets his flight home. <laughs> we'll see. And finally, Group H, Ukraine and Czech Republic. Now, this is the game I'm looking forward to the most today. I don't know about you. I think that's the big game of the day today. Obviously, both of these teams just stomping through. Not only are they 3-0, but they're hardly losing a game along the way. And I know that when we interviewed the Czech Republic after getting their third win, they... So this is a thing that obviously everyone wants to win all the time, but... Given that they're basically through already, you would think, well, it doesn't right. matter. But they just want to top this group. They want to make a statement. They want to destroy Ukraine today. So let's see if they can hold up on that. There's definitely some interesting stories coming today, a lot of which you'll know about if you've been keeping up with the Hearthstone Championship Tour over the last right. weekend. Uh, of course, the spring European playoffs happened. And um, there, there may be some rivalries that are going to have come out of that. And you'll recognize a lot of the faces today. Yeah, and obviously the deck submissions have been released for the America's qualifiers or the America's playoffs over this weekend coming, which you can see here on this channel. And those deck lists are going to be talked about through the day as well. Looks like it's going to be a very controlling meta over the weekend. It's going to be interesting to see what comes out on top there. Important thing to note, though, as far as the uh, the American playoffs deck list goes, um, those deck lists were released after the submission deck line for this competition. Right. So you're not going to see decks today influenced by the decks that were released recently. These decks aren't just come up with on the fly. They were submitted over the weekend. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens, actually, because... The submissions for today were after the European Championships, and of course the American submissions would be influenced by the European Championships as well, uh, I believe. And so we, we could have this situation where we get the controlling stuff happening today, but let's find out if everyone's reached the same conclusion. It is, of course, a very different format here. All right, well, before we jump too far ahead, game number one of the day, it's going to... Oh, game number one of the day is going to be Belgium versus Kazakhstan. That's the one I was expecting to talk more about that, but we'll get back to that in just a moment. Followed by Chile versus Norway. You and uh, Gaskin are going to be bringing us that one. Yeah, that looks like a good one as well. Um, Norway, a team who have individually are doing very, very well at the moment in various aspects of Hearthstone. Going on to the big one third of the day, and as you can see, Peru, Romania, Mexico, Turkey, closing it all out. Yeah, it's several big games today. We've got Romania, who uh, I don't know if we've touched on this before, but they've, they've still, they've just about got a chance, I believe. Yeah, um, 
yesterday's defeat for the UK basically gave Romania some right. decent chance the way it works out because they have to play Thailand themselves so they can do a good job of knocking Thailand down the, like, the rankings. But they definitely, definitely need to win this one. And, uh, and RDU going to be leading that team after his win over the last weekend. Yeah, and he's upbeat. He thinks they can do it still. I was chatting to him in his stream earlier today and he fancies their chances, although obviously knows that they've got a lot to do to get there. Well, there's no point in playing if you don't have a little bit of hope, right? Yeah. It's good to see that, that RDU is still optimistic about his position. Um, even if a team is 0-4, though, they still, it's still important that they complete the rest of their games because the, their standings can affect the rest of the, yeah. of the group, right? Yeah, and I mean, it's just as well, there'll be this again next year. The teams want to generate a lot more synergy. They want to get used to knowing each other. And so even the teams doing badly are desperately trying to get those first wins. We saw from Croatia yesterday, they just want to prove that they're good at the game. Speaking of familiar faces from HCT last weekend. Maverick, ninth place in the Swiss, not quite able to break through into top eight. Yeah, Maverick, we'll talk about that again in a moment as well. Um, having a bit of a nightmare of a weekend in some ways, but still reinforcing that he is one of those players that pros talk about as one of the very best and has yet to prove it to the people watching at home, but we all know how good he is. Also from Belgium, it's Olek, Chinois and Arnij versus Kazakhstan, led by Neyman, Pulmark, Japatox and Smirtokotic. Yeah, Kazakhstan, Neyman trying to lead the way there. Um, he didn't get into the HCT this round around. He only, I say only like that because he only got 15 HCT points. Oh. Like you do. Just, only? Just only. It's more yeah. than I got. It's more than I've ever got. Yeah, exactly. 15's plenty of HCT points, but it wasn't quite enough to get him through. So Neyman's been a little bit at the background of the HCT front, but he's in another tournament at the moment, and he's doing very, very well in that highly well-known tournament. So Neyman's de definitely still a force to be reckoned with. It's a tough competition to get into HCT, you know? It's the best players across Europe played last weekend, the best players in America playing next weekend. Yeah. So um, it's no easy feat. Like You can't really judge someone just for not getting through to one season of HCT. It's it's a lot of grinding to get there. To be honest, after seeing the European lineup, I'm not really sure why the Americans are bothering to play this weekend. Whew. It's it is a pretty good lineup, I've got to say. Just, like, just hand it over now, boys. Alright, game number one is gonna be Chinois versus Neyman. This is the Hearthstone Global Games unique format. For those of you that are joining for the first time, it is it may look a little bit complicated, but it is just a best out of five game. Each player has two decks. Uh, so that each team represents all nine decks. Uh, it's blind pick, so Chinois and Neyman now have to decide whether they want to play uh, Priest and Hunter for Chinois, Mage and Hunter for Neyman. They're going to have to decide that now. If we get to the fifth game, one player is going to play a second time for each team, the ace player for the ace match. They're going to have to choose between the deck they didn't take earlier or the special ninth ace deck. Special ninth deck meaning quite often the deck that they don't want to play. Quite often the worst deck. Hoping to win 3-0 or 3-1 and not have to look at that Warlock there for Jibbertox on the right hand side. Uh, some teams like to get it over with early so that it makes them harder to predict later on and some teams like to hide it away at the end of the day and hope it was never even a factor. It's funny how that's the way that the Hearthstone Global Games formats kind of turned out where often Ace deck means worst deck because ace player usually means best player. So, or right. at least player that has the, the team has the most confidence in today. It's going to be Chinois on the priest versus Neyman on the hunter for game number one. Interesting. Interesting to see how Neyman's hunter is built. He would have expected to play against the priest with those two options. And so let's see what he's got. Maybe I say this every time and it never seems to happen, but maybe there is a Swamp King Dread or maybe there is a Call of the Wild, something like that in there just to give that final push against the priest. You really wanna you really wanna get these late game hunters in, don't you, Neil? Yeah, one of the problems with Hunter against the Priest is cards like a kindly grandmother can just get stolen and post Ooh, be so careful madness. post of madness trade into a one one cat and then the priest keeps the three two and you're like, why did I turn up today? All right, I'll have a quick look at the players. Chinois loving the hat. Yeah, Chinois, no bad player in his own right. Uh, last year, DreamHack France went 15 and 0 winning that event. 15 and 0? 15 and 0. 15 matches in a row. Not 15 games, 15 matches in a row. That was DreamHack Tours, right? Yes. Yep. He won the Swiss like 7 or 8 and 0, and then he won whatever <laughs> other format there was after that and he just kept winning and winning and winning and if you don't know who Neyman is then uh, first place winter championship last year for Europe yeah a uh, very well-known player he's been uh, he's had his ups and downs in Hearthstone for sure but he's certainly 
on the up at the moment and one of the most respected players across the globe. Yeah, and I think there is an element of this team. We've been a bit unfair to the team. But there is an element of Kazakhstan that is Neyman trying to carry the team a little tiny bit. Uh, the other players are definitely competent, but I think Neyman is feeling the weight of the pressure on this one, of you know, him having to do it all. All right. Uh, it could actually be any type of priest from Jinai's based on this hand. Yeah, just priest, priest is always... Pretty sure every priest ever runs these cards. Yeah, I mean, they are just the best priest cards. If you started building a priest deck, these are where you'd start. It's uh, funny, because in the old days, Shadow of Pain and Shadow of Death would have also joined that list. Right. But not so much anymore because of their exclusion in the Silence Priest. Yeah, it turns out that when you're making a combo deck to kill people on turn four or five or two in some cases, that you just haven't got quite the room for the removal. So you have to let the, your opponent get on with what they're doing a little bit and you get on with what you're doing and hope you do it quicker. Just before we get into the game, don't forget everyone back home, this is a team format. So both Chinois and Neyman will be communicating with their teammates throughout this game and throughout the entire series. Uh, sometimes the players group together and actually play looking over each other's shoulder. Others, as we can see here, they're just going to be communicating uh, through their chosen Internet mm -hmm. thing, internet, internet software. Internet things. You're learning from me, young man. You are learning. That's not good. Acolyte of Pain for Belgium is a hint that this is probably a silence priest. Yep. Going to want that card draw to draw those all important combo pieces. Uh, again, at the moment, not much going on at all for them, but they're going to draw a bunch of cards and get it all set up sooner rather than later. Silence Priest, certainly the dominating priest archetype this week, as I believe it's the only type of priest that we've seen. Neyman picks up Rat Pack. Kind of, kind of a shame. His curve is, is a little bit awkward here. He can just plonk down every single one drop, and that's fine. If he picks up a Leoc from Animal Companion next turn, this board could get nasty very quickly. Yeah, and this is good for the Potion of Madness as well. It's like, sure, you trade my one drop for your one drop. I don't mind this. Yep. Um, but we're going to have to watch out for the Rat Pack and stuff like that. And of course, he will be very careful not to get stuff that is important, stolen and traded. One of the strongest things about Potion of Madness, the re one of the reasons that it didn't see much play in Tilt and Goro, is just its, its insane synergy with Radiant Elemental. Zero mana spells are actually very, very, very strong. And yeah. being able to play it with Radiant Elemental on turn two, develop a body and clear some minions off the board. Draw a card from Lyra while you're yeah. at it. Makes for a strong card. Yeah, the, the deck is incredibly powerful like in synergy. It didn't appear immediately, or well, it did appear immediately, and then everyone said, well, looks a bit meme it's all been on the back burner for a few weeks and then people have tried it over and over and realized it's just a synergy with radiant elemental with lyra with the silence effects with potion of madness etc is just so powerful that this is a deck that you have to consider when you're building lineups now yeah the creation of, of i guess what has become the proper build for silence priest it did take a lot of interesting thinking because like we said earlier throwing out shadow of pain and shadow of death two core priest cards that have usually been in every priest deck like, it is weird when you go back in time half a year and right. think about it. But yeah, a lot of the great breakthroughs in Hearthstone come from people who are willing to just turn and realize, hang on, this isn't a core card. I don't have to play Shadow Word Death. No and matter how good this card is, I, I can be willing to chuck it away. And hang on a second, that one drop did not trade with another one drop there as the Potion of Madness dealt with both the Tabby Cat and Huffer. Yeah, Huffer done a little bit of work, but not enough. And you can see Kazakhstan here. Just fighting off, trying to keep these minions on low health totals so that if there are the Divine Spirits and such like, then they just don't die in one turn. Yeah, that's one of the most important things, I think, for Hunter and for a lot of decks against Silence Priest. Just whereas in the past, often you try and make efficient trades and only attack into things if you're going to actually destroy them. Against this deck, it's actually important just to chip away at the minions' health totals. As you say, just to prevent the Divine Spirits getting too insane, as we see Circle of Healing, not a common card in Silence Priest, picked up. Norse Priest of the Feast, actually. Hmm, interesting. So maybe it's something slightly different. Notice there that Neyman chose to kill the 3-3, three, three, not the 2-3. Uh, you might think what's weird about that, but the 2-3 was the Radiant Elemental, but it was at full health, whereas a 3-3 three, three could have been healed into a 3-4, right. uh, which would have obviously have the potential to become a much bigger minion if this, assuming this is a Silence Priest. Right. Well, yeah, I, I think... So Neyman kind of raised his eyebrows when he saw that Priest of the Feast. Right. I wonder if he's now suspecting that it's something different. Priest of the Feast, not one of the more common cards in this deck. Circle of Healing, certainly not one of the more common yeah, cards. Yeah, so it could just be a miracle priest, which definitely is very, very low down the priest popularity polls. But in this event, you do have to make sure 
that you don't become too predictable. And so playing a different deck every week or most weeks is definitely an important aspect of that. Don't forget that after this stage, there's another round robin stage of another three matches. Right. So all of these teams have got to not only get through this, but make sure that they don't become predictable don't, along the way and maybe save some stuff as well for those later stages. Pa the power of Priest of the Feast just being demonstrated there as it eats up a kill command and the second charge of Eaglehorn Bow. Against Hunter, Priest of the Feast just has the ability to just heal up over and over and over again. So it's actually more important to kill that than deal the face damage. And dealing face damage as Hunter tends to be pretty important. Yeah, it really does. Although, depending on your build, of course, sometimes right. you can just wait until you get the high main and bigger stuff. But yeah, in general, you, you're hoping to get enough damage done so your hero power becomes relevant. And it only really becomes relevant when your opponent's down to maybe 12 or less. Right. And even less you know, against the priest, obviously. I'm just admiring this Lyra here. It looks like Chinois is going to be rewarded as Naaman currently doesn't have any way of dealing with her. He doesn't, but there's only one Divine Spirit in uh, Belgium's hand at the moment. So the first spell they get from Lyra is going to be really important. Yep. Depending on what they draw off the top. I mean, if they draw a powered shield, their next turn is definitely just going to be insane. I mean, even so, doubling Lyra's health now means that Naaman once again won't be able to deal with it. Yeah, I do wonder if there's a deadly shot <gasps> in Naaman's deck. Second Divine Spirit. So, okay, so one of those Divine Spirits came from Lyra, the other came from the deck. So I guess it is a Silence Priest. Or at least a priest that relies on divine spirit in the fire. We haven't seen a silence, a purify, an ancient watcher, or a um, humongous razor leaf yet. So I guess silence priest may be not the name to call this one. Yeah, just a comment. I mean, like all of the classes, pretty much at the moment, everything in priest can be built as a bit of a mishmash. Yep. Especially if you just take out the dragons and you're going, uh, what level of miracle slash combo do you want? I want this. That actually came from Lyra. It's not in the deck. So don't panic. It's just still not necessarily a silence priest. Would I ever panic, Dan? Have I, I ever been slightly nervous or... Yeah, okay. I would panic. I Help. certainly would. Panic. Another silence. Just go ahead. Silence everything. You know, question he has to ask himself now. The silence is golden. It is. It is golden. <laughs> Lyra's golden. Yeah. Um, the question he has to ask himself is, does he, would he rather have a silence or a random priest spell? Turns out, Chinois would rather have a silence for later. Yeah, one of the big selling points of Hunter is just those death rattle effects, so why not keep that silence back? Uh, they couldn't kill Lyra last turn, they probably can't kill it again now, in which case you can still use the silence next turn against, say, a big rat Ooh, pack, for instance. And yet, yeah, Chinois's, Chinois's face. face! He is really, really pleased about that because the obvious play is just to silence last turn and keep going. It is. That is the obvious play, yeah. And the patience that I'm always talking about, so rewarded here. Naaman does not look happy about that at all. He's got that wry smile on his face, Ooh. though, of, you know what, you got me. Right, right, that, right. That isn't a you're an idiot smile. That's a you got me smile. Yeah. And, you know. As we, uh, as we see a 2020 Lyra appearing and actually ending the game. Right there. 2020. He spots it. Perfect vision. And straight to the face. 1 0. And just rewarded for very strong play there. And all Nyman can do is look at it and, yeah, it's just smile. Like, yeah, you got me. Well played. Well, the strongest play that game, I believe, was just playing Lyra when. Um, right. When it's kind of risky. It depends how greedy you want to be with the Lyra, because often you want to play it when there's a completely empty board, and actually when you can go ahead and play plenty of spells straight away. It's kind of risky playing it both when there's already a minion on the board and when you only get one spell in. But Chinois did it, and it really paid off. Yeah, he he's made you know assessment that there weren't going to be enough stuff for for Neyman to do to deal with, and it's interesting that Neyman even played that hunt. I wonder if there was some tech in there we did not see, uh, maybe a deadly shot or similar. Or maybe he just felt they could deal with it. Uh, but we're going to get into the next match, though. Belgium with this 1-0 lead. Maverick versus Hallmark. It's going to be Warrior versus Priest. And as you mentioned earlier, Maverick was unfortunate in the HCT this weekend. Came ninth on tiebreakers. One spot behind eventual winner, Hoy. Yeah, it was a very close one. He's definitely going to be out for blood today, wanting to prove that Belgium have got what it takes as he's not able to compete in Shanghai. He's going to want to be competing in this competition for as long as possible. Yeah, and I mean, he'll definitely... He had four opponents that he played against that he was relying on for tiebreakers going to the last round. He needed one of those four guys to win and he would have been in the top eight. 
and all four lost. So he's not going to want to wait for tiebreakers in this event. He's going to want to make sure that it goes nowhere near that and Belgium just get their three wins and get through. Yeah, but if he loses one more, if they lose one more series here, he may have to rely on tiebreakers yeah. in this event as well. Maybe this time they'd go his way as we see him there talking aggressively to his teammates. I doubt there's anybody more focused this week in all of HGG than Maverick. Uh, we've seen the likes of RDU be able to fight back from adversity. And Maverick, is, this isn't the only time he's been sort of quite close and no cigar. It's happened to him several times. So, yeah, hopefully this, well, not biased, but it would be nice for him if this was one of the places where he could get some redemption. I agree with you. It's certainly heartbreaking to see someone get so close to achieving their goal and then miss out based off of, not not a technicality, but as you say, just yeah. tiebreakers. It, it's just, it's a factor that's out of your control and it, it's just, it's hard to it's hard to watch. So it would be nice to see him make a comeback here. Belgium already 1-0, so gonna, his team are gonna be feeling confident already. Yeah, and Kazakhstan obviously off to this terrible 0-3 start in the HGG as well. And I think they're still you know, going for it and everything, but, you would give Belgium the edge here. It's just a decent team. Chinois, like I said, 15-0 at DreamHack Tours last year. We've had Neyman, who has won a championship event. Sorry, what am I saying about Neyman? <laughs> Cracking up completely. Neyman, Neyman, Neyman won. Winter yeah, but he's playing against them, so I'm right, right. not quite sure I brought that up. But, but Neyman did win a championship. <laughs> You're right, though, Neil. We've had Maverick Neyman being powerful. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, he did. <laughs> um, talking about Kazakhstan, they're 0-3 in the group. They're 0-1 in this game. How do you think they're going to be feeling as they go into the next game. I can't say that word on this particular oh. broadcast. This is a PG broadcast. Keeping it, keeping I it imagine chart, they won't be particularly pleased right now. And obviously, just going down to the Belgium team, Arne is top eight and top 16 at various PGL Tavern Tales events. And Oliek is more of a streamer. He's got 70,000 YouTube subs. 70,000. So they've got three strong YouTube. players and a guy that is incredibly popular. Right. Well, low popularity never hurt anyone. Speaking of popular, Shadow Word Pain, not a popular card in Priest nowadays, as we've just been talking about, and uh, there's two of them in Hormug's hand. So it could be a nod to some dragons coming up in the future, just because they don't really fit in the other versions, unless it is another miracle priest, but I'd be surprised. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I do want to ask uh, Chinoy is what that priest deck was because I'm not I'm not certain either way about what it I was. I think I think it was probably just miracle priest with extra bits of combo thrown in. There seems to be a a scale of how much do you want to have um, the combo in your priest. It seems that even some of the more controlling decks do just throw one copy of divine spirit and inner rage in there. He went with two. Um, interesting to see what he did and with the acolyte of pains as well. They were looking for a very card advantage deck. Yep. This looks like a Dragon Priest to me. And finally, I can use my experience from the last weekend of playing in a matchup, as I played a lot of Dragon Priest recently. Uh, and in my opinion, this is a hard matchup for the Priest. Okay, so why, why what makes it hard? For me, it just seemed like you could you know, Shadow of Pain, the, the low attack taunt, and then put down some five sixes, draw a million cards and win. Why doesn't that work? It's absolutely true, but the problem is eventually the warrior completes the quest. And at that point, your minions never have more than eight health. Right. And the, you're just losing a minion every turn or losing eight damage to the face. Sometimes the Dragon Priest can come up with a lot of early game pressure and win the game quickly, but this this isn't early game pressure. Right, so you need to get those early one, two, or one threes and two threes down and just exert some sort of damage to make sure the warrior doesn't just chill like he's doing now. Yeah? Even just something like Nether Spite Historian into, you know, so you've got two Draconid operatives in hand or something. Right. Uh, if, if turn five comes and there's still no Draconid operative, then uh, Hallmark's in trouble. Of course, that's assuming this is a Dragon Priest. And he doesn't even have a Dragon in his hand at the moment, so right. you know, it could just be straight up control. On the flip side, he does have a nice and early Elise the Trailblazer. Right. Uh, and Elise the Trailblazer early means that Shadow Visions can get you an extra pack early, and you can just win the game with enough value. So you'll be looking to get that on the board and just go for value. Uh, looking at Belgium's hand now, though, uh, not what they were looking for. If you get the cheap taunts, you want them to fit on curve. You don't want it to be this cheap. And the honorary dire horn, although it's okay, and probably what they'll take here, not quite what you're looking for at this point. Yeah, unfortunately, it's not actually super common that you'll get a discover option that fits the curve exactly as you need it to. It's much easier for you as the quest warrior if you've already 
got the curve, like if you've got a Bloodhoof Brave in hand and you've got, got a curve and you can use the Discover to maybe get something better to play at some point or something to play later, this is um, unfortunate for Maverick. Yeah, he may be looking at how do I use this coin? Do I want to coin into the Direhorn on turn five, perhaps, and then just have a late Curator? Or, or do I want to just have these two drops and weave them in nicely? And that's what he's going to do. And he's going to play that with a Ravaging Ghoul by the look of things. Yeah, good thing about Corner Sentry as well in this matchup is there's no real punish from the Priest. Yeah, they can pain it away. They can play Potion of Madness. But pain is worse on something like an Ali Armorsmith or a Direhorn Hatchling. Right. So, uh, Corner Sentry should be pretty safe for Maverick to play, even without the Ravaging Ghoul. So Hallmark here, his only... On curve play is Priest of the Feast, which you tend to want to keep back for the healing, of course. But this isn't a mage Maverick's playing. This is just a hit you very slowly deck. So is that healing particularly relevant? I think that he actually has to play it because okay. there's, again, early game pressure is pretty important. He has nothing. Nothing on the board currently contests the Priest of the Feast properly. So um, I'd play it while you can. And then if it does eat up removal, then you've got a lease, which maybe won't eat up removal. Sure, okay. Yeah, if the least just sticks, a 5-5 is one of your few big minions, especially, again, we haven't actually seen for sure this is a Dragon Priest. and even, We haven't. Even if you pick up an Operative, you haven't got a Dragon to go with it for now. We're not sure that it's not a Dragon Priest, because, again, all right. of these cards are incredibly common in every Dragon Priest list. Uh, and, obviously, it's not a Silence Priest. We know that much. Uh, I think Maverick, could he infer from this Priest of the Feast play that... Uh, Kazakhstan are suffering a little bit for, for some aggression here. I think that they can infer that from the fact that nothing was played on turn sure. one, two, and three. From the fact that there <laughs> is no aggression. They're going to infer <laughs> that there's no aggression coming. I okay. mean, it's it seems very unfortunate when the priest hasn't even had a another spite historian to right. start filling up the hand with dragons. Uh, I'm guessing with the mulligan, uh, Holmark would have had to mulligan for pirates, which is why we've got cards like Shad Shadow Web Pain. I, I forget sure. which cards were kept in the mulligan at this point. Curious Glimmer Root, okay. Huh? That's seen in some Dragon Priest lists and also not in other Dragon Priest lists. Cheers, Dan. So, Cheers, Priest. Yeah, it's... Priest is really hard to, to, to assess with a hand like this. Well, at least we'll get to see more of um, Maverick's deck in a minute. One of the great things about Curious Glimmer Root, actually, is um, not only can you use it to see what cards are in your opponent's deck, but... You get shown two cards which you know 100% are not in your opponent's deck. Right. That can be particularly helpful when you're against a mage, and uh, you're not sure if it's Secret Mage or Discover Mage yet, because right. if you're shown a Fireball and a Kieran Tom Mage, for example, then you know that they run the Fireball, because they always run Fireball, right. and then you probably know that it's not Secret Mage now, because you've just been told they don't run Kieran Tom Mage. Yeah, that makes sense. It's information from the Glimmer, information from the Operative as well in the other direction of sometimes. Course. And so information when you're stealing stuff as a priest always seems to be handy. Remember, this is not a discover. This is what Dan was saying. One of those cards exists, and it is the brawl. I wonder which. I... I've seen Weaponsmith played. I saw. I played against Jumbo on Ladder recently. He was playing Weaponsmith. So if you play Jumbo on Ladder, guys, you play Weaponsmith. I'd almost, I'd almost believe it, but then you'd have to also believe that he's not playing Brawl. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, they've been cut down to one in some of the versions. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm being a little bit um, a little bit facetious. Would I do that? But, yeah, it, they are, it is a thing that we've seen occasionally, although it's very rare. Yep, yep. But Interesting Hearthstone Global Games, the format difference. There's only 30% of players this weekend in NA going to take Priest. And oh. yet here I would say that nearly every team has played Priest at some point over the last two days. Yeah, well, it's it's like a uh, it's like a fifty-fifty each time, isn't it? Like, do you pick priest or do you pick the other class? Right. It depends very much on the pairings. Whereas in HCT, you're only taking four classes out of the nine. There's nine classes. Th yeah, there are actually nine classes right. in Hearthstone, Neil. There are. I thought there were eight. No, that's that's fifty fifty as well. There are nine. There's just the ninth rotating class that just never sees play. Sure. But yeah, I mean, it is surprising to me that Priest is getting picked so much here, but not at all in a Conquest. But like sure. you say, this is different. You're trying to match up against your opponents much better, uh, whereas in Conquest you are trying to build a full lineup. And as the meta slows down significantly this weekend, Priest is obviously going to be one of the classes where people can be greedy, but only 30% of the people have chosen to go that way. We are really learning very little about Hallmark's deck here because Glutton Zoo is another card that some Dragon Priests are running and some aren't. It, there aren't many more of those cards that he can draw. Eventually, he's going to draw a card and we're going to say, 
ah, we know what this deck is. Right, and it, the longer it goes without drawing a certain card, the more I'm inclined to think it's probably not Dragon Priest. Sure. Um, just by the statistics, there's, there's going to be two of more of the key cards that aren't in Dragon Priest, etc. Mm -hmm. And so we're more likely to see them. But yeah, like you say, I mean, I wouldn't be at all shocked if the next card off the top is Dragon Draconian Dra Operative. Well, I'm so now I'm now, now I'm sure. less sure. That helps, right? Sure. That that gives us a much better understanding that it's likely just a control increase. Yeah, it's looking like it's more of the control. -y. Maybe miracle, as you mm -hmm. said earlier when we were speculating on Chinois's priest. <laughs> Confusing priests from both sides today. How very interesting. Oh, that dirty rat will actually ruin Hallmark's day if it comes out and uh, rips Elise from guests, his hand. Yeah, but the timing is going to be interesting. You don't really... Well, what else? Actually, I was going to go the other way, but most of the things in Priest you want to play from hand, most of them do have Battle Cry effects. So, yeah, Maverick might get on with it and play that Dirty Rat fairly soon. Obviously, you want to do it when you're brawling later on, um, when you've got the weapon up, but... It's not going to be so bad if it takes the Pyromancer, but, yeah, if it takes Elise, then... Um, you've got to think, we haven't seen a Shadow Visions yet. Okay, okay, he's, he's playing the safe, he's playing the Elise. We haven't seen a Shadow Visions. As long as a Shadow Visions has picked up before that pack is, then that's just an extra pack for Hallmark if he wants it. Extra five cards, well, probably five cards, sometimes three or four, yep. uh, depending how much you get to empty your hand. <laughs> Which Hallmark isn't really going to be very good at doing over the next few turns, as there's not much he can play. Yeah, we're going to be here for the long haul in this one, and Hallmark is going to have a lot of cards as the game goes on. He is he's going to really want to see Maverick drop an Ali Armorsmith, a Diahorn Hatchling, something big that Shadow Word Pain can just pick off. I mean, you, for what you said earlier, still stands to some degree. Um, Belgium are just going to be able to start shooting things off the battlefield when yeah. they do complete their quest. And so there's still some pressure for, or Kazakhstan still needs to exert some pressure or they will just get behind. I'm expecting this matchup to be even worse for the Priest now. Now, I already said it was a bad matchup before. Right. But at least Dragon Priest has the ability uh, of, of exerting this early game pressure. Hallmark's Priest has not done that at all. Uh, yeah, he may be able to drop a Medivh the Guardian soon and maybe fill up a board that way if he's running it. But otherwise, I don't know how he's going to win this game. Maybe he's going to have to rely on Elisa's packs. And this is a nod from Maverick to how unscared he is. He's willing, as the, the warrior, to generate a tense board state, which normally, as a warrior, you're not willing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, you're, you don't want your opponent to have some sort of stuff going on, because the longer you can survive, the easier you're playing all these taunts, the better it is for you. But he figured that, you know what, I think I'm OK creating this board state and not just, just not panicking. Yeah, just look at the answers in Maverick's hand. We've got Whirlwind, Ravaging Ghoul, Sleep with the Fishes, and Primordial Drake, which can come down next turn. That's the ideal situation. If Hallmark creates a board that Primordial Drake can just get rid of, then that's perfect for Maverick, though I expect Hallmark will play around that a little bit. Yeah, it's one of the cards you do have to pretty much play around, but... This is very strong for Hallmark, actually. Yep. Forcing through some more damage. But of course, as long as the warrior hasn't completed the quest or hasn't played the Sulfurus, at least he can still just keep armoring up. He has Armorsmith in his hand as well, so lots of damage going to need to be done by Kazakhstan. And although it looks menacing, Belgium have a handful of answers because they've been so patient with their play. They certainly do, though. Hallmark has played around that Primordial Drake we were talking about perfectly, putting both minions on four health. That being said, priests tend to struggle to deal with Primordial Drake. Yeah, I mean, it does have those priestly f hating numbers on it. What, what are those numbers? I don't know. There's some eights and fours and stuff lying around, and priests just find it very difficult to kill off. Why Why can't priests deal with minions that have four attack? Um, I don't know. You'll always be playing priest. So, going this pickup that they picked up from turn three, or turn two even, to... With this in mind, basically there's a board clear here while still managing to get a taunt and a ghoul on the board. Uh, Belgium's forward planning is paying off a little bit there. Now the Priest of the Feast being picked up. There's just a lot of generic Priest cards in this deck. Yeah. Unfortunately, no pressure. No pressure at all. and They, they, they struggled to generate that 8 damage a moment ago and that's that was like a massive victory for them. But they need a couple more massive victories to make this even a contest at the moment. Yeah, they need a Lyra. That worked pretty well for Chinois earlier. 
Yeah, Lyra is definitely one of the cards that swings things. As you say, the pack, maybe a Shadow Visions, those are all cards that could turn it around. And it wouldn't surprise me, possibly just a big top-end minion lurking around, maybe a mind control, something like that could turn this on its head. Yep, ever since Shadow Visions appeared, uh, these one-off priest cards that would never see play, like right. Inner Fire, like Divine Spirit, and like Mind Control, just become a little bit better. Because um, it, it's, it's you can get it more consistently. If you're playing against a control yep. deck, you mulligan it away, you try and get Shadow Visions as soon as possible, and then you take every Mind Control you can. <laughs> Double three from Amber, something like that yep. might also turn it around, get some massive minions. But, you know, Maverick's not messing around. He realizes he's up against something that's trying to generate pressure and failing. Woohoo, there's Medivh the Guardian. Talking of pressure, there is a card that can definitely help to generate some pressure. And I think we might see some three from Ambers in this same deck, to be honest. Yep, absolutely. That makes sense. Medivh does tend to synergize pretty well with three from Amber. For those of you that don't know, Medivh the Guardian, when he is turn to the board, uh, creates the Atiesh, the one one attack, three durability weapon. What the Atiesh does is every time you play a spell, it summons a random minion of that cost. And free from Amber is an eight mana spell that summons an eight to ten mana minion. Right, and the fact that you do it both in the same turn, so you summon the eight and you summon the ten yeah. or whatever in the same turn is... Not only is it good value, but it's value and tempo all in one, which is a very, very powerful thing to do in Hearthstone, which is why a lot of decks play cards such as Firelands Portal along with exactly. Medivh that do the same thing in the same turn. Exactly. It's, that's what I was going to say. It's, it's, that's what you compare it to. Unlike Firelands Portal, Free From Amber doesn't actually deal with a minion, but the board you create tends to be a little bit stronger than the one you'd make from Firelands. Of course, uh, Hallmark will be playing around Brawl to some degree. And plus, he hasn't got the cards we're talking about in his hand at the moment either. And so this is more of a setup for the future. Uh, but Maverick doesn't know that, and he has to deal with as much as he possibly can. Because if Medivh lives and Maverick does not have Brawl in his hand, then he is not going to last much longer. Yeah, Hallmark's best bet at the moment is probably Dragonfire Potion. As we see, the quest is completed. The yeah, warrior. and this is going to be a big turning point in the game, completing the quest, because Maverick can now just start to gain that card advantage and start to commence the beatings. Yep, and this is where the game just, just becomes horrible for Hallmark, impossible to keep up. Uh, the worst thing is that Maverick already has board control. Typically, by the time the warrior completes the quest, because the taunts aren't quite as strong as regular minions, the stats suffer because they're taunts, the warrior's lost board control by the time this happens. But not this game. This game, not only does Hallmark have to fight to survive against this Ragnar's hero power, he has to fight to get the board back. I mean, he does have Brawl in his hand. Of, of all the, I'm not quite sure the priest should have the Brawl and not the warrior, but that's how <laughs> things are standing at the moment. So he's going to have an extra board clear along with these double dragon fires. And he needs to know his stats, he needs to know his numbers, and work out how he thinks he can generate a board using the Atiesh and get himself in a position where he can maybe try and somehow do this last 16 points of damage. The one weakness the warrior does have when it uses that quest oh. power is that, as we see, pretty horrible from Kazakhstan's point of view, Grawl. Yeah, the one advantage they do have as the priest is that the warrior can't heal up anymore, except with double armor smith. Yep, that's true, and his health is relatively low. It's, got, it's down to 16, so maybe there's some hope for Hormok there. That Brawl leaving the most horrible minion for Hallmark alive, the one that he just can't deal with. It's a dragon, so dragon fire potion doesn't touch it. It's got four attacks, so shadow of pain and shadow of death can't touch it. Pound in the swear jar. And um, he summoned a validated doomsayer, which can be great from a Firelands portal if you've got board control, but unfortunately, Maverick can deal with it for free. Yeah, he has a million different ways of dealing with this. I mean, just dropping double armor smith, whirlwind ghoul, and then bump into the uh, doomsayer gains him eight armor and starts putting, I think maybe me one turn lethal on the board. Um, and that is just going to make Kazakhstan have a, a really bad situation. Obviously, I, I only quoted that exact example. There are things that Maverick can do. He may want to play around extra AOE, which is what he's going to do. But he has so many options at his disposal here to deliver a lot of damage and set up lethal yeah. that he didn't even need to defend himself too hard. Yep, just going to go ahead and execute it. Makes sense. He's got a second one in his hand. No reason to hold on to it. And now Hallmark. Oh, Priest of the Feast, Powered Shield. 
Is that how you start? Summon a one drop? Does look like he might have to do that. Uh, at this point, he could also use the actual weapon. Uh, face tank. Can he even survive if he does that? He can't, I don't think. Well, he, he can't. Dragonfire potion. It doesn't, it doesn't deal with Primordial Drake anyway. Of course, the Dragonfire potion doesn't kill dragons. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe the best play is Priest of the Feast, double Shadow Word Pain. Get rid of the rest of oh. Maverick's board. Summon some two drops, then Power Word Shield. You heal up. I think by you nine. Have to power word shield because well, depending, he will know what his outs are better than we do, but okay. it feels like he's got to dig for now. What we can see just doesn't seem to get him out of trouble. Free from Amber, let's go. Ah, that's a shame because by, by the time the Shadow Visions is used, uh, Homark is going to have lost his ATS charge. Let's actually see what's in the deck. Binding Hill. Free, free from Amber. Amber, that's the one he wanted. Yeah, that's does he have time to keep the free from Amber? Is there. The trouble is, he's expecting to take eight more to the face, so yeah, he's having to take the Potion of Madness. That works. That works well, actually. He's just healed a lot. Does he get the attack in? I, I'm expecting that he did get the attack in. Yeah, quite often, quite a lot is queued That's when you're right. in observer mode. Yeah, he did get the attack in, but can he make this work for him? He had to use so much resources there and didn't really... I mean, he looks great. He did a great turn, but he hasn't really got anywhere. What he did do is gain a lot of health, which may have bought him some time. Not much time, but that Runic Egg actually will also buy him an extra card, which mm -hmm. could be relevant. That Primordial Drake is just living through everything, though. Yeah, surviving that Brawl was a massive deal, obviously. Um, Kazakhstan will now be just hoping that they pick up the pack, I should think, and trying to get something of use there. Now they've used the ATS. So many, so less options. <laughs> Available to them. So few. So few Let's go with that one. available to them now. Free from Amber. Okay. No ATS, so this card's not quite as strong. It is capable of getting you a charged Devil Saw, which does have the ability to hit the face because the battle cry saying it can't hit the face doesn't right. go off from Free from Amber. Though it wouldn't matter. Homark just wants to get rid of that Drake. Yeah, Belgium have the brawl in hand as well now, so they're going to have every chance to to do the two two shots to the face for eight. That should be enough. Uh, Kazakhstan will know that. They'll want to heal up twice over the next two turns, if at all possible. But they need to set up a situation where they're just not dying. And it's hard to see any play that doesn't involve this play. Deathwing Dragon Lord, just simply because it's a 12-12, seems like a great pickup. You can do some sneaky things with Nozdormu, though I think Deathwing Dragon Lord looks like the card to me. Yeah, the Mastodon is also interesting because you do get to Potion of Madness if anything else is played, but I think the Dragon Lord is probably better. It does, of course, the Mastodon does, of course, stop the Primordial Drake from hitting face one more turn as well. Yeah, okay, so the Taunt is relevant. Obviously, um, Death and Dragon Lord gets summoned now for free, so it, the, the, mana, the mana doesn't matter. Uh, really considering, though, it's actually harder than we gave it credit for. Gonna go with the Death Wing. Yeah. I mean, this this allows him to actually be able to win the game in two hits of the face if he can somehow get through. Right. Well, let's see if Deathwing is good at winning brawls. It's going to need to be. I don't think I even care. I'm just going to press the button, see what it hits. If it hits face, they'll go face. If it hits Deathwing, they'll trade, I guess. Sure. Maybe they'll brawl. Do they need to? I think they lose. They can lose if they yeah, brawl. I, think I don't think they right. can lose if they don't. I don't think they need to. You're right. Like, <laughs> they can wait one more turn why before you, they're desperate. Why would you create the opportunity to lose both of your taunts? You're right. That was that was a silly suggestion. I guess the question is, do you want to armor smith? What what right. are the pros and the for, uh, pros pros and fours? The pros and cons of playing the armor smith here. Uh, the pro being you're going to get more armor when this deathwing starts smashing into your drakes. Uh, the cons being that if they do have a dragonfire potion after they trade, they the, the armor smith and the target get wiped out in one shot from the potions. I'm thinking forwards a little bit here. I'm trying to work out next turn. So if Hormark makes this obvious trade with the Primordial Drake, I was going to say, does he heal the minion or heal the face? I think he has to heal the minion so that it survives a Ragnaros hit as it's the only way of winning. But now he's picked up Holy Nova. Things have changed a little bit. Yeah, because he'll only get himself to seven, but with that extra heal, then it'd be nine in two turns time. The important thing is, what? it doesn't set up a 50-50 for Maverick because if the... Hero power hits the Deathwing, it survives. Mm -hmm. So it's like a, it was just a dud. I think that the he'll consider trading Deathwing into the Drake, playing Holy Nova just to heal up himself and his minion, and Shadow and Pain away the Tar Creeper. 
Yep, yeah, seems lightning. Like I say, going to have two turns as well. Um, if if he doesn't get hit in the face this turn, he will survive one more. Uh, it does mean, of course, that Belgium going to get that 50-50 with the Armorsmith they kept back into Brawl. And that wouldn't be available to them if it was on the other way, because Dragonfire Potion would have been played instead. And yeah, Kazakhstan are healing up face and trying to buy one extra turn somewhere along the route here. Makes sense. The most important thing here was that the Deathwing survives the Ragnaros hero power. Both executes are gone, so it's safe on 10 health as long as there's nothing like a slam or something. So, two 50-50s, if they want it, they just go Armorsmith, Brawl, and the 50-50 to win the Brawl, which just wins the game, and then if they lose the Brawl, they're 50-50 to hit face. They can also play Armorsmith and the Tar Creeper. To raise, those first th to raise right. that first 50-50 to uh, two and three. But they wouldn't have the option to do that same play next turn. However, next turn, Kazakhstan are going to be on nine. Mm. So, they may not even want to do it next turn. They may feel the need to do it all now. Uh, the other slight concern, although it won't be a big one, is that Kazakhstan could have a dragon in their hand. Right. It seems unlikely because right, they've been struggling for minions all game. We know it's not a dragon deck, but there could be a stray Twilight Drake. That's a good point. About. I hadn't considered that, but certainly Maverick will be considering that. Yeah, I think he'll realize that there probably isn't, but it's something he needs to at least just pay lip service to. He's going to take it to the 250 50s. He thinks 75% will do him. Thank you very much. Does he win the first one? No. Nope. No. Now he's going to win the second one. And okay, he wins it. right. He got it. Maverick will have been quite concerned while pressing that hero power after he losing will. the brawl, but he takes it away. Game number two for Belgium. Two out of two games so far. One more to up Belgium's group score to two wins, two losses. Yeah, if they can get this done, they will be in a good position in this group. This, of course, is the group with Canada and Malaysia, both on three and zero. Those guys play tomorrow night. Kazakhstan really need to start winning some games. Their game record is actually almost as important as their match record because if they're going to have any chance of getting through, it does rely on their tiebreakers too. So if even if they do win the series now, three wins, two losses, it's still not great for them. Yeah, they could be in a world of trouble. Uh, this is one where Belgium have to pick Paladin. They don't have to, they can pick the Warlock, but most people choose not to pick the Warlock. So this is the more predictable one. They're going with the Paladin, and Jippertox taking advantage of that, picking the Shaman, which will put them in a fairly good spot, I should think. Uh, funny matchup this. We talked about it yesterday. We said that we believed that the Shaman was favoured most of the time. However, the game that we witnessed yesterday, the Paladin was able to just steamroll the early game, and the Shaman had no way of keeping up. Yeah. And uh, I definitely know people who think the Paladin is favoured. I'm sticking my guns. I think that random Shaman versus random Paladin, I still think the Shaman has got the slight edge. Um, also, I think that Kazakhstan think that, otherwise they would have picked their own Paladin. Things have changed recently, though, when it comes to Shaman. It has to be said. We noticed yesterday, I think we, there was one. One Evolved Shaman yesterday. Right. We've been fiddling about with it since the broadcast. We're going to have to learn a little bit as we go along. I'm not sure how that affects the Paladin matchup too much. Yeah, there's also definitely Elemental Shamans being submitted for NAHCT ah. this weekend. 49% um, of players taking some form of Shaman, although that isn't the most common form. 49% taking Shaman. That's um, that's actually a, a quite a surprisingly high percentage. I think. Yeah, I think the Jade Shaman was likely the most common pick. Uh, but Evolve is moving moving into second place, so definitely not a surprise if we see that deck here. For me, that deck came out of nowhere. I discovered it about a week ago, and I, I thought it, I thought it was some guy joking around at Legend. Like, oh, I've hit Legend, it's fine, you know, I just, I just play whatever, but nope. Then there was another one, then there was another one. Exactly. And then I learned, oh, this is actually a thing. Yeah, it turns out that when you play a combo deck that can defend itself and be aggressive at the same time, you're playing a combo deck that's pretty good. See Patron Warrior for details, although, this is a far more simple combo than that one, of course. Now, the deck that you should be comparing to Patron Warrior is obviously Quest Rogue. Shh. Yeah, you'll upset Sottle. <laughs> don't want to upset Sottle. It was a joke. Please don't hurt me. Hurt him. <laughs> All right, we're going to jump into game number three. And this does look like the Evolved Shaman to me, first impression. Yeah, it could be. It could just be a very aggressive deck as well. Uh, we've seen a lot of token Shaman being played um, around the places, especially in HCT last yep. weekend. Um, RDU, I think, brought a very aggressive Shaman. He did, that's right. Totem, so... With Twilight Hammer as well, I think, as well. I think he did. I think he did. I Twilight Hammer or sure. Hammer of Twilight? 
one of those two it's things. It's got the words in. It's got the right words. I, I mean, for me, if you've got most of the words correct in some order or other, I usually take that as a win. All right, cool. All right, so Can't Murdoch's wait. getting a pretty good-looking start. Tidecaller Coin Seer, then War Leader is a very difficult start to deal with for any deck. Uh, Jippertox, of course, here with... Uh, it's also a difficult start to deal with for any deck. Just play one drop into Claws, into blow up your weapon, make a patches. Seer, I think, indicative of a very oh. aggressive Murloc deck. And yep, as you uh, as as your audible reaction does make clear, this is definitely an evolved shaman. So for those who don't know how this works. Basically, Kazakhstan will be looking to occupy the board and generate pressure early. That might not work too much against an aggressive Paladin, so there'll be a bit of a standoff. They'll basically keep it level. What will then happen is at some point, Kazakhstan will drop Doppelgangster, and from their point of view, hopefully with an Evolve, which will give them three six drops, and then they'll win easily. So, some of, these, some of these Shaman do, and some of these Shaman don't run, Devolve. Right. And that's actually one of the more relevant cards against Murlocs, because obviously Murlocs buff each other constantly, especially after Cold Light Seer comes down. And actually turning all of these two and three mana cards that have been buffed a bunch down to one and two mana cards that haven't been buffed can be a huge swing back in your favor for the Shaman. Yeah, I mean, the Murlocs are only good, like you say, because of that synergy. We can see here this curve of Coin Seer into Murloc War Leader is going to generate an army of pretty big Doody Murloc guys. Doody Murloc guys. Yep. Then. Okay. Um, but the second they get devolved, they just turn into a smattering of one and two drops that don't have any friends or synergy, and they just they just roll over and just die. Um, but no devolve in the hand, and so Jipper Tox is just having to make sure, do it the old-fashioned way, kill things as they are played. Uh, awkward turn for Olek here. Actually, um, he's not going to want to drop War Leader when it can just be killed. He's not going to drop Cold Light Seer and it doesn't get its effect. Looks like he's going to have to just play Stonehill Defender and hope for the best. Yeah, Stonehill Defender, obviously. Pretty good in Paladin. We all know the three legendaries it can fetch. Plus Ruffy on the Paladin. That is also a legendary. <laughs> That's number four. It's not number four. Um, Fetclaw is number four. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, looks like he will end up having to take Psychotron to slow this down. He does not, of course, know what he's up against yet. He'll have a good idea. But it could just be Jades or it could be Evolve. So playing on Curve is the best he's going to have for a while. Yep, he agrees with you, Psychotron. Uh, some of the guys go for the Grime Street dude. Uh, it can be really strong in the late game, giving your uh, other minions Divine Shields. But as you say, he wants to slow this down. It doesn't know exactly how this is going. And uh, something like a Flame Tongue Totem could have really swung this game fast in Kazakhstan's direction now. We're now seeing, though, why Kazakhstan took so long last turn to clear up the Murlocs, because this turn with that overload, there is very little going on. Mm -hmm. uh, making the healing totem may just convince them to trade everything in here. Uh, before that, it was looking a bit grim. Yep, as much fun as a Manatai totem would have been this turn. You're right, it's it's not, not playable, but... Jepatox is able to get rid of the rest of this board, or get rid of this one minion on the board, and kind of stabilize. And Belgium still in this unfortunate position where, again, Murlocs are all about synergizing with each other. So playing one just doesn't feel good. Yeah, and which one do you play? The Seer is surprisingly strong when you play um, this over and over again, getting that two or three on the board. But, you know, buffing all the other guys. But your war leader is your win, not your win condition, but it's your out of the blue damage condition. Right. Uh, which you often need, the explosive damage that that can deliver. But you don't really want to just put a big target on the board, which is the war leader. You kind of want to sneak your seer down and hope it survives. Uh, I'm curious to see that there are two Spike Ridge Steeds in this Paladin deck from Belgium. Because I said, you know, there's Cold Light Seer, that means this deck's aggressive. Spider Steeds, not the most aggressive card. Right, and they did have their own Stonehill Defender as well, which, you know, is no surprise to anybody, but um, there are so many ways we keep saying you can build these decks. All right, Kazakhstan pick up Flame Tongue Totem. Turns out that even though it doesn't get played that often anymore, it's still rather good. Yep, it, it's it's not as common as it used to be, as you said, but it's uh, when it when it does do its job, it does its job very, very well, allowing that Firefly to just nice and cleanly get rid of the Cold Light Seer. 
The question is, is it better to just drop Stonehill Defender this turn and fill up your hand with more value? Yeah, they'll be looking, I think, at playing on curve. They know that these Murlocs could get out of hand. Uh, if you play the Stonehill Defender, something can go wrong. And uh, not a huge amount, in fairness, but even a Megasaur just buffing your one Murloc is underrated as a play. You, you make a 5-4, plus you turn one hey, thing on the board into a killing machine. I think uh, just playing Gentle Megasaur with no Murlocs on the board is <laughs> also an underrated play. It's a 4 mana 5-4. Yeah. It's absolutely fine. Uh, I think it's better than just wasting a Murloc Wooly, though. So you can make a totem, it'll be in the wrong place, or you can play the Flame Elemental, it'll be in the right place. That'll be another consideration here. But again, wasting mana. Every pro Hearthstone player is like nightmare. <laughs> Uh, now Gentle Megasaur is definitely not a good play because two totems is all it would take to clear that up. True Silver Champion looks like a very obvious pick up there. Now he can just um, use it to get rid of the Flame Totem. Yeah, Oli seems pretty happy about that pick up. I uh, can't see beyond the play you just described. Play the True Silver, take down the Flame Tongue, and then next turn the True Silver is up to deal with whatever the threat is that's played next turn, and you can defend the Divine Shield on your Psychotron which in turn means that your Spite Ridge Steed will also get some good value uh, if nothing gets hexed along the way. Yeah, those four two weapons are just very, very strong, generally. Look, look back at Death Spite for an example. It gets rid of a minion that's already on the board and then gets rid of another minion. Sometimes it's dealing with two minions that both cost four mana, so uh, it, it does a lot of work and it does it very, very quickly. quickly. Yes. Just nothing to say about this, apart from this is going to be the play. Uh, something they're going to have to watch out for from Kazakhstan's side here is they'll be scared to play their doppelgangster because of Consecration. However, they will want to make a big wide board because the Bloodlust in their hand and Firefly off the top is exactly the card to solve that problem that I was just about to describe. Right. Uh, <laughs> it's not bad at all. All of these cheap minions which could bait out removal or oh, boot bait out AoE rather, but might not even be worth baiting out the AoE. And this is where this deck's real strength lies. As you said earlier, you can test the board early. He can put up these, this Firefly, Flame Elemental, Stonehold Defender, all of that stuff. If he gets removed and then Kazakhstan can follow up with Doppelgangster Evolve, it's just such a strong board, such a strong swing back in their direction. Yeah, I mean, if you can get a Consecration out of your opponent's hand, you can even just play the Doppelgangster on its own sometimes and not be scared because you have all that synergy with the Bloodlust, you have that synergy with the Flame Tongue, but one of those is gone. Yep. And they're, they're going to set up this wide board and challenge Oliek to deal with it. And at the moment, Psychotron kind of helps, but it doesn't deal with it. And of course, the Mana Tide needs killing as well, because all the time it's digging one card closer to that Evolve. Really curious as to just how late game this Paladin goes. Blessing of Kings, another card that <laughs> that signals towards being an earlier, more aggressive Paladin right. deck. I mean, Paladin is all over the place. Uh, you were talking about the True Silver being good as a 4 2. We've seen people playing Rallying Blade yeah. uh, just because it does a very similar job to True Silver in the current meta. There's not that many 4 health minions. Obviously, we can see there's Megasaur. Obviously, there are some 4 health minions, but 3 is often enough damage. Second Bloodlust. Second Bloodlust. Way to send a message to your opponent. These metas where double Bloodlust exists is, is, becomes pretty terrifying to play against Shaman. It also gives Kazakhstan um, something strategically to play towards here. I think they'd probably have been looking at using this first Bloodlust to clear a board at some point. Right. Um, but now they can, if they want to, try to build up a board that just wins with double Bloodlust on turn 10. Yeah, that looks like it's going to be a possibility this game. Thing from below, already down to two mana. I think two mana five five seems like the best out of those three options. With a hero power this turn, they're both going to become one mana five fives. And this is a wide board for Jypertox, and it's not going to be going anywhere. Okay, here we go. And is he going to ask the question? I think you take off the Divine Shield on the, the Psychotron here. There's no reason just to leave a 1-2 chilling on your side of the board. Doing one damage to a Divine Shield is always the right amount to do to it, as a general rule. Yep. <laughs> always generally. Makes a lot of sense. And yep. now you've taken that shield off, you've set yourself in position where next turn you can consider a gigantic Bloodlust, amongst many other options. You know, Psychotron looks a little bit like a Murloc. It does. 
Just looks a bit like Murloc Wall Eater there. Seems like it would fit nicely in this deck. And, and he's now almost an annoyer to him because he's really annoying with that spike with Steed on it. Yeah, very annoying. Riding a dinosaur. Uh, Maelstrom Portal picked up from Jypotox. Not actually any good for him whatsoever now. He doesn't have an Evolve to synergize with a Double Gangster, and he doesn't actually have space in the board to play it. Nor does he want to yet because he hasn't seen a Consecration. It's almost like a weird form of stalemate here. So working out with this Maelstrom Portal, uh, how the Bloodlust interacts. So the Maelstrom Portal is going to do two with that spell damage. Takes the Cyclotron down to 5-3, which means that with the Bloodlust, your zero attack minions will actually kill off the first half of the Spike Mish Steed. Right. Uh, which means that you should be able to deliver six to the second half quite easily and still may maybe punch through eight to the face. Uh, the downside of all of this is that they are going to lose three minions and next turn they have to rebuild before playing that second Bloodlust. I think the biggest downside is probably losing the first Bloodlust because it means they no longer have the, the capability of playing two Bloodlusts later. Obviously, it was a necessity to play this. I think that Kazakhstan are going to want to start picking up some more cards that generate more value. They're going to want their Evolve as soon as possible. Right. This is a read turn, by the way. This is a turn where your opponents consecrate if they have it. Right. There, there isn't much better than Consecrate, make a Murloc hero power that you can face here. Okay. Uh, if you were Belgium and you had Consecration, you're unlikely to mess around with this board. Just, just get rid of it. I'm wondering, you've seen a Bloodlust though. Do you think you could wait one turn if you had Primordial Drake and play that? You could. Yeah, I mean, it's not a 100% read. It's only a soft read. But it's, it's definitely a turn where Kazakhstan will feel okay. But what they've seen now doesn't tell them anything, unfortunately. <laughs> that play could have been made quite comfortably if yeah. Consecration was in hand. So much as they would have got the read from it if there wasn't a better play, Belgium have found a play that not only is strong, but deflects the, from the fact they haven't got Consecration or, or the Primordial hand. Now, Jaipotox picks up patches here. And... I'm curious as to if you have any idea why he mulliganed away the other Murloc in his opening hand. Uh, the other the pirate? The other pirate, sorry. Um, I guess that he, his, he had a one drop in his hand and it was the Firefly, right? Yep. And he kept the Jade Claws. Yep. I guess the, the point is that when do we play patches? So we go turn one Firefly, yep. turn two Jade Claws. Yep. You're looking at turn three play my other half, the Firefly, plus the Pirate, but maybe they felt that just wasn't a very exciting curve and that they could find a decent looking 3-drop like a Stonehill Defender to go instead. Okay. Uh, you do get a lot of draws when your turn 1 and 2 are built. Oh no, because you'd have to find another 2-drop, but yeah. you do get a lot of draws between turn 1 and turn 3 to really round out your curve perfectly. So maybe they were looking to be a bit greedy. Both Bloodlusts gone for Team Kazakhstan on the bottom there. Maybe they just have to rely on Evolve now. I guess they've decided they win this game by sustaining in the long term. Right. They just need to keep away this wave of Murlocs. Yeah, I mean, they are not the aggressive deck in this matchup. No. The, they are actually the control deck. Uh, we've been casting it as if they were the aggressive deck because they got off to such a flying start, yep. got rid of all the early Murlocs, and they've been having a chance to win with those Bloodlusts. But actually, they are still in position where... Doppelgangster Evolve wins the game unless the opponents get a quality Consecration, and they may not even be in a quality in their deck. Yeah, as so we can see, there are no board clears whatsoever. Bluegill Warrior, another card that doesn't make its way into every Harlem deck at the moment. Again, only the most aggressive ones. Poisonous, allowing that Bluegill Warrior to make quite the trade. Yeah, Belgium have been getting very, very good value out of their cards in this particular game. And this is the frustration when you do play this Doppelgangster combo. At some point, you have to start thinking, do we just play it on the board? Well, you can't because you've seen no Consecration, you've seen no Drake, you've seen no Equality. As far as you're concerned, even though it's aggressive, all of those cards could live in your opponent's deck. Right. And so you, you keep making these wide boards as a threat, but the threat's gone. The two Bloodlusts have gone. That's, that's the thing your opponents usually panic about. Well, Evolve is still a threat. It's a very realistic threat that Alec will, will have a good... Have a good inkling that Jypotox is running in this deck, I think it's safe to say. Jypotox using his hero power as much as possible, milking the value that that Shaman hero power can get you. Yeah, and they are going to start just building a little bit of their own board, finally, Belgium, but they are a bit low on stuff. Uh, keeping back the Blessing of Kings, going for the Megasaur play instead. Not 
the stuff they were looking for. Yeah, this should be this huge, swingy wave of Murloc. That was bad. Wow. Um, but it's Almost not... Almost like the Murlocs are here with us. <laughs> Thank you. I've been working on that all week. Nice. Uh, but no, it's just not happening. There, the, there isn't quite what Olek wanted. Death Rattle doesn't seem completely horrible. That's that's four plants. One one is two two in total. Well, it doesn't seem great. Taunt does very little entirely. Going to go with it. Yeah, both teams playing defensively right now, and sort of correctly so because they're both out of stuff. Jade Lightning seems very strong to me as Jypatox. Well, first he can hear a power and try and get right. spell damage to him. If we he go. gets that, then he's just dealing with the Murloc Wool Eater nice and easily. Yeah, this is again why this Evolve deck is so powerful because it's just not reliant on the Evolve combo. It has all this other stuff going on. Uh, the late game Jade start becoming a thing. Uh, nothing too strong, though. Depends how many Jade Spirits they play. Probably none some of the time, even. That being said, I'm sure that Jypatox would quite like to pick up his Evolve sooner rather than later. I mean, if he picks up Evolve, he wins the game. That's how this deck works. Right. If your opponents cannot deal with a wide board, if there is no equality and this deck is too aggressive to play in equality, I think, um, then they do just win the game when Evolve comes because three six drops, one of them is usually a bit of a whiff. The, there's there's some pretty bad ones, but for the large part, six drops are pretty good. Yep, yep. We, we, I was talking to Sosa about the stats between six drops and five drops, uh, I think, last week. And relatively, six mana minions don't tend to be as high value for their mana cost as right. five mana minions. But when you're summoning three of them right. for six mana in total, you usually get a pretty good deal regardless. Exactly. You're getting... If you take three off because they're bad, let's say that, you're still getting 15 mana's worth of stuff for six mana and a card. Right. Like an extra card. But as it stands at the moment, they are almost getting the position where they've probably got two more draws before they have to start panicking. No, nope, don't worry about that. They can just play Stonehill and pick that's, up something nice. That's a pretty good one. Alec here would be a pretty great pickup for Jypatox here. Oh, boy. There's nothing big to copy from the Faceless Shambler. Right, the Craze Worshipper just doesn't have the right shape to really do what they want right now. I wonder, because Belgium's hand is empty, I wonder if it's Doppelgangster time. I don't think so. Um, and I don't think so because it fills up your board, which means you don't get the value out of your totems, which this deck also relies on. Although, again, we've seen one Flame Tongue and we've seen two Bloodlust go. So the value of the wide board is quite diminished compared to normal. But this is one thing a wide board does do. Suddenly, the value of the wide board makes a lot more sense for Jypatoxus. This is a card that Oleg just can't play. He's nerfing two of his minions and buffing five of his opponents? Yeah, I'm just looking at how he could go about this. So you can trade in the Murloc first into the 3-6, get a free kill there. Yep. You can put the Megasaur into the Stonehill yep. for another free kill. That gets rid of two of your opponent's things. Pretty you can good. use your two silver to kill off another one. That gets rid of three. And then your three minions aside, and you've got a Tarim. So okay. there is the possibility to get it. You might not play this. I guess you do, because then you can hero power as well. They've got to consider serious if they want to do that, but I think we might find them actually find a way to get this Tarim onto the board. Yeah, it just again, it illustrates the strength of the card, where even though Jypatox's board was so wide, as you've described, there's an efficient way of removing most of these minions anyway. Tarim himself is a 3-7, which means um, with everything, right. with, with nothing else uh, affecting the board, it's going to take three minions to trade into it each time. Yeah, and it doesn't usually come down to the 3-7 the bit. It's something that everyone talked about when it was like released. Yeah. But, oh, look, it stops three of them. Oh, and they've actually kept him back. You're going to be a little bit greedy there. Yeah. Try and deal with one more turn from Kazakhstan. Yeah, why buff up these 0-2s into 3-3s? Three three? So this is absolutely fine. Uh, makes a lot of sense. But they've put themselves in position where they can if they want. But yeah, the 3-7 would have been relevant there. Um, but now these, these minions that last turn picked up the free kills can pick up more free kills, and actually there's just no hurry at all. Okay, Consecration going to do a pretty... Uh, well, a large amount of work here, I think. Presumably. Uh, they will look at saving it back. Like, they had some fairly good trades available to them. They just didn't look for long. Didn't look for very long at all. That's the wrong one! That's the wrong one, Kazakhstan! 
You put the wrong Darwinism in your deck. I don't think they'll be too disappointed, though. No, it seems good. Ah. Now they've got them both. There he is. Round of applause there. Slightly sarcastic as well, because that like deck's it. getting a bit thin. But he may seem like he's a little. He may be feeling like he's a little bit too late. And unfortunately, Sunky Patarum is going to do work regardless of what happens here. That's not bad at all. Giving your opponent a minion that just can't attack. Yeah. Uh, I'm just interested to see how this timing works out. This is going to be very. Uh, Holyoke's laughing. He knows that he's just kept this timing back perfectly, despite they had an okay chance to play it. And it's just going to make a mess of things. Aya! Aya Blackpaw from the Evolve. Interesting that they chose not to make a totem first. They wanted to scared totem, of making. Right? Um, first, we'll get a totem. They're scared of making a Doomsayer as well. Uh, totems yeah. cost one, I believe, now. Yeah, they do. Um, really great thing for Jibertox here as well is that that 1-1 one is actually going to become a 3-3, and there's no efficient way that Olek can trade around it to prevent that from happening. Yep. Though, this is a lot of damage. This is a lot. Six damage potentially going to the face straight away. I don't even know if Olek needs to trade and play around things. He's just so close to yep. winning the game. And that's not going to get them out of trouble. It's going to help them get through the Tarim a little bit quicker, but they can only get rid of um, Tarim and one of the Murlocs. So even if there's... 12, unless they get a Taunt Totem. Even then, they're That'd still going to be taking nine damage. So even with this perfect Taunt Totem roll from Jibatox there, it looks like Belgium going to take this series with three wins and zero losses. Yeah, Maverick and his friends not messing around. Um, you want tiebreakers? We got tiebreakers. 3-0. <laughs> Take that, um, Kazakhstan. And Kazakhstan, unfortunately, dropped to 0-4. and four. And although they still have to play Canada, they will have been technically eliminated now, mathematically eliminated from the competition. But I am absolutely sure that Naaman is not the sort of guy to want to go 0-5 and, and risk all the Twitch jokes that go along with that. All of the Twitch jokes. Well, there's, there is... Um yeah, <laughs> there's still a lot to fight for. There's a lot of reputational things on the line. Although it's not Naaman as the individual that's going to get picked on. Uh, he still wants to represent his country. He's going to want to ensure that they don't have the worst score. Yeah, I mean, that's another thing that all of these teams that are struggling are going to have to play for is some of them are going to do worse than others. It's the ones who do the absolute worst that are going to be remembered. Okay, <laughs> doppelgangster, a little bit too little, too late. What happened there? There wasn't. Uh, the the oh. plant can't attack. On of course it can't. Of course it can't. It's fine. They must have rolled the taunt, and the plant can't attack, basically. So. Right. We were just talking about it being over, but actually it wasn't quite. That being said, I'm not sure what Jipertox could have picked up to change the, the to, to change the tide of this game. The world's best lightning storm <laughs> probably changed it around. I don't even think most of them are running lightning storm anymore. Exactly. I believe Maelstrom Portal is the only one in the stack. There is that thing again. What on earth is that? Freak, I'm terrified. Freaked me and Raven out last week. Either way, congratulations, Belgium, taking their third win of the series. What on earth is that? Yeah, it's scary. We, we thought it moved last week when he it, did That he did, definitely moved. He did the same thing, and it looked like it like slithered off the screen. It was um, it was a sight to behold. Let's not take away from Belgium's moment, though, from Alex's moment as they take the third game. Let's have one more look at how this series went. Chinois with his Priest, Maverick with his Warrior, and Alec with his Paladin just stomping Team Kazakhstan. Yeah, and despite the fact that a couple of their picks are slightly telegraphed, Kazakhstan could do nothing about it, and Belgium, convincing winners, you can't say anything other than that, about a 3-0 win, and Belgium in the prime seat, it's in their own hands now to get through to the next round. They play France in their last match, and if they win that, they will almost certainly be through to the final stage, or to the second stages. Not a bad position to be in, considering I believe Belgium were a zero wins and two losses, at the start of the Hearts and Global Games, they've beaten Denmark. They've now beaten Kazakhstan. Now they just have to beat France. Uh, <laughs> we're going to get the chance to ask Olek about that that creature as we have an interview with him. Hey, Olek, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. How are you? Great. How are you doing? Congratulations for your win. Uh, I, I have to ask you, what is that that you're holding? Oh, my wizard. 
Your weasel. It's Emma. She is wonderful. You like it? Uh, it's scary. Yeah. Well, no. A little bit. It's not scary. A little bit. No, 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 no. French community, uh, no, uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, weasel. Right. So congratulations on the win anyway. Uh, obviously bringing you lots of help there. Um, how do you feel about your upcoming final match against France? Are you going to take that one down easily? Thank you. Uh, yeah, it was really uh, difficult, the last game. Um, but uh, we, we just deserved, so uh, we were confident. Um, I'd like to ask you a little bit about Chinoise's Priest, if that's okay. Uh, yeah. We weren't sure going into it. Like, we, so at first we thought Silence Priest, then we saw the Priest of the Feast and the, and the uh, Circle of Healing and thought maybe not Silence Priest. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that deck? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a list from uh, Shoshi, it's a, it's a player from uh, Sector 1, and uh, it's just a list where we don't play um, many silence. Of, uh, mm -hmm. In fact, we just play uh, one uh, silence to, uh, to zero, and we play more with a uh, body like uh, Priest of the Feast and yeah. uh, cards like that. So, so it focuses around Divine Spirit in a fire to win the game still? Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. All right, well, congratulations. That was a incredibly solid performance from all three of you. You can go away and celebrate now and good luck in your final game of stage one. Thanks a lot, thanks a lot, thank you. Wow. It's a weasel. Yep. <laughs> it's a weasel. <laughs> uh, helping them tunnel their way to victory. <laughs> very, very good, yeah. So yeah, very, very happy looking team, obviously on the back of a victory, but also says they are confident going into the next round. And why wouldn't they be against France, which will presumably bring a few jokes out on the Maverick side, as he is often mistaken for being French. Maverick's not French. There you go. I, well, exactly. I, I was wondering why he was playing. In the same years. way that you're not Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we're just about to see some highlights. Looks like we're getting that. Ah, there we go. As we look back at the first game today, it's that priest deck that we weren't sure about. The Divine Spirit there came from the Lyra. That's why we were so unsure. I think we saw one later come from the deck. So um, it makes sense what uh, Oleg told us. Yeah, and this, this was just pretty brutal from start to finish. And the, the really key play was not going all in. Well, first of all, playing the Lyra, but then not going all in on Lyra. Uh, kept back the silence effect, which meant that the, the next turn was just not helpful from Kazakhstan. You see Neyman's reaction there. It's like, yeah, you, you just got us. You just sorted it out. The question that Chinois had to ask himself there, as I said earlier, was would you rather have a silence or a random priest spell? Mm -hmm. He decided, I'd definitely rather have the silence, and it paid off. Yeah, it worked out very nicely in a deed. In fact, it worked out absolutely perfectly. Uh, this game, Kazakhstan just never managed to generate any pressure, and Maverick accurately took advantage of that and won this game fairly easily in the end there. That winning of the brawl though, meaning that that Drake stayed on the board for I don't know how many turns, it's but just, it was a lot. It's just such a tough matchup for the Priest, especially once the quest is complete and the Warrior Hero power starts every single turn, just whittling away all of the Priest's resources, free from Amber, never made an appearance after the Medivh. It was just a shame. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't meant to go the Priest's way. And then game number three, a little bit later, it was the Paladin versus the Shaman. Yeah. Shaman just ran out of stuff, wasn't able to get the Evolve down at a good time. And when the Evolve did come down after the Doppelgangster, it didn't matter because there was a Sunkeeper Tarion. Yes, yeah, so it turns out that Sunkeeper Tome is a good way at dealing with all that Evolved stuff. All right, we're just going to have one last look at Group F. Lorinda was just telling us about uh, what, what the group's looking like now, but there it is right in front of us, Kazakhstan with zero wins, four losses, a 4-12 game record. Yeah, and it means that Canada and Malaysia just have to wait a little bit longer. One of them will go through tomorrow when they beat the other one, but because of how the fixtures work, it is possible for teams to get caught, although with 9-1 and one game record, Canada are still looking pretty, pretty much whatever happens. So for the uh, conclusion on the Canada versus Malaysia thing, do not forget to tune in tomorrow. I believe Rob Wing and Cora yeah. will be bringing us that game. That's one to look forward to. But don't go anywhere just yet, as we have four more series. Hey, hey, calm down now. I'm not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere. We have four series of Hearthstone still coming today. Next up, Norway versus Chile. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. We're almost there. Quiet down, everyone.
This is not like any of our previous expeditions. This will be far more ambitious. We're stepping into a land of primordial wonder. Infused with astonishing elemental energies. The plant life here holds very unusual properties. So don't touch anything. And while you may be excited to see the local fauna, you might want to make sure they don't see you. Because their powers of adaptation are devastating. Make no mistake, we will be tested at every turn. But if we stay on our guard, we might just survive. Now then, are you ready? Then let's journey into Ongoro Crater.